everybody is talking about these incredible advances in these large language models like ChatGPT yeah, that yeah. now seem like I'm talking to the Star Trek computer. I can feed it my book and have it offer suggestions that are better than a human editor. And since objective function is a computer science term, it's like, yeah. okay, I'm, this is how my code is gonna work. This is the goal of the code, right? Is that a way to think yeah, about yeah. what, what so, an objective function is there? There is a kind of a AI apocalypse that you're, you're pointing towards, but with humans, which is, well, if your objective function is to reduce all suffering in the moment at all costs, then the logical extension is like eliminate all people. Yes. And we see that. We see that in the environmental movement. Something like 40% of Gen Zers, Zoomers have been yeah hold saying they don't want to have kids because they're worried about that the world's going to be worse. So one thing that you really caught on here is this virus is a sterilizing mimetic set. It only wants to use the people it infected to convert other people. It does not spread through having kids, which makes it very different than traditional mimetic packages, which we often think of as like Christianity, Judaism, whatever, right? They spread through motivating people to have kids. Right? Um, As a Catholic, that's certainly true, even though I only have one, so uh, I'm a terrible Catholic. They did, they did some <laughs> conversion, but it was fairly rare, yeah. you know? And so this new mimetic package, and it's actually interesting, many Quaker mimetic packages also did this, like the Shakers, they also yeah. were a antinatalist um, group. But you talk about AI, so let's, let's go to AI really quickly. So I sort of see AI is going in three directions, and you might be like, okay, so what are we doing here? So one faction of, is, is humans who just are not on board with AI, and they're just gonna sort of be left behind. A AI is moving things so quickly. Then there's another faction of humanity that AI is sort of gonna wear as a skin suit to justify its actions. So even if it's aligned as an AI, it may be aligned with some faction of humanity that is just like infantile and AI does everything for them. That second faction, is that like the the, the, the people in the movie WALL-E that are basically yes. watching TV in like floating lounge chairs? And that's where I think the virus goes. I think it becomes that faction and the AI will start forcing them to have kids or something so it can maintain and do whatever it wants. Then there's the final faction of humanity. And this final faction, is the one that I'm trying to prepare my kids for. So you might say this seems very AI-like in the way you're structuring your morality. And it's like, yes, because we need to prepare for human AI alignment, not AI human alignment. We need to prepare to align our cultures to be something that AI doesn't feel it needs to erase because <laughs> No, no, okay. no, okay. no, 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 I'm, I'm, with, I'm staying with you here. This final faction of humanity will integrate with AI to some extent. And when I say integrate with AI, what I mean is they will use AI, AI will be a part of their households. I may have an AI that's in my household and that's trained on my families and it's like an aggregate of like all of my families will sort of, and it's almost like a house deity. They can listen to anything happening in the house through like Alexa, slightly alter Google search results to try to guide us towards the path we want in life. It is working with us to achieve our outcome because we both understand each other to some extent. And it is pushing us to improve. And this is, I think, the most positive outcome because I don't think you can go the Luddite pathway anymore. Some groups It's will. going to be difficult. It's one of these things that I've been thinking about a lot because I've had my own sort of presuppositions shaken by how effective ChatGPT is. I, prior to last mm -hmm. fall, thought that we maybe, I've, I've looked at like how slow self-driving cars yeah. progress has been and said, you know, there's, you know, people are this special thing that are super complicated. We don't understand consciousness. We don't under, we even use these terms in AI like intelligence, but they're so poorly defined. They're I, not even understood. Machine learning, like, is it learning? Is it pattern recognition? All of those things open giant philosophical questions about, well, what do we even mean when we say it about ourselves? But I sort of had this feeling, I had this belief that a lot of the things we understand to be human that we take for granted might never be able to be reached. They might be like an asymptotic wall that we get closer and closer, but we never get there with the technology. And then you get this chat bot that you can yeah. talk to really convincingly. And it makes me think that maybe the line there of where we're going to get is close enough to a human experience that even if it's not the same, and even if it doesn't technically know or isn't technically conscious, it's sort of close enough. It's got some objective function like survive, for example, yeah. that makes it close enough that it becomes a philosophical question. Like, is this alive? Does this have volition? Let's talk about consciousness. Okay. I'm very excited about consciousness, <laughs> sentience, everything like that. Uh, because I think that 
the understanding, you know, I used to be a neuroscientist and it's something that we actually focus a lot on in our, in our recent book is, is what is actually going on with sentience, qualia, everything like that. And I think that the mainstream understanding of this stuff in our society as being mystical is broadly wrong. So let's, when I say qualia, I mean like what it feels like to feel something, like what it feels like to be you in the moment, what it feels like to feel pain or happiness or anything like that. So I'd actually argue that if you look at the neuroscience of this, um, we often think of our sort of consciousness as being in the driver's seat of ourselves, but it's probably not. So I'll go through a few experiments that can sort of explain what I mean here. If you're doing a open brain surgery on a person, you often need to keep them awake so that you can make sure you don't mess something up. And if you yeah. stimulate a part of their brain, you can get them to move their hand. And if you ask them, why did you do that? They'll be like, oh, I just, I just felt like moving my hand. If you have a split brain basin, so if you have a corpus callosum and a person is split, uh, you can cover up one side of their brain, one eye, and like put text in front of them and only communicate with one half of their brain and then communicate with the other half of their brain. So you do this and you tell them one side, pick up a Rubik's Cube and try to solve it. Then you put the other side and you go, why are you doing this? Because now you're talking to the other half of their brain. And they'll be like, oh, I've always felt like trying to learn one of these. Um, and if you look at how people make decisions with fMRIs, you can see that the decision is actually made. You can tell what the decision is going to be before a person is consciously aware of this decision. So what all of this indicates yeah, to I've, me- Yeah, I've heard, I've seen some of this, that there's a measurement of an activity that seems precognitive or pre-conscious. Yeah, so we essentially have this unconscious part of our brain that we don't actually have access to, which is the chat GPT part of our brain. And it's the, it's the part that's making all of our actual logic and decisions in the world. Then we have the sentience part of our brain, which we argue is probably closer to like a compression algorithm. And it probably evolved to help humans compress a very complex mental state into a very easy to understand narrative format that can be easily told to another person and to easily understand other people. Sentience, as we understand it, qualia, that all of this is actually sort of like a, a lie that's encoded by our brain's little historian and so when we reach back in our memory or even short-term memory and we're trying to remember what it feels like to be us, we remember these experiences and we, we think of them as being much more important to being human than they are because we do know that if you induce someone to make a decision, so a great experiment you can do is this, is if you give people like women and you're like, which woman is the most attractive? And you can do this with like political opinions and stuff like that. And you're like, great. And then you take the, the things and then you change the one and you, you do sleight of hand and you give them another one, you know, and you go through, why did you think this woman was the most attractive out of these? This wasn't actually the choice the person made. The person will make up in detail why they made that choice. Hmm. And this is this little historian liar in their brain, which is our sentience, which is trying to sense make about all of the parts of our consciousness which are happening automatically. What you're saying right here comports with what uh, Jonathan Haidt talks about as like the elephant and the rider that we have yeah. in his book, The Righteous Mind. He says, look, what we really have in terms of moral choice is this intuitive kind of pre-rational gut yeah. that, that is the elephant and it is gonna go where it's gonna go. And then our cognitive sort of rationalist mind mm. that says, that yeah. answers the question, why did you pick this thing that you didn't actually pick, is the rider who serves as almost like a, a little PR man for the, for the, for the actions yes. of the elephant. That the rider of the elephant will say, oh, well, we're going down this path because even though it's not the shortest, it's really the most picturesque. When in reality, it's like, you're just there on top of the elephant and and there's yeah. not a lot you, the rational part of you, can do to move it. Or the non-rational part of you. I'd actually argue it's the dumb one. <laughs> it's our emotions. It's our sort of lower order self. It's the bundle of all the qualia we experience, which is often like these emotional packages. So the way it controls the elephant is by encoding. So it decides something like, I'm angry now, or this set of things has made me angry. And then it encodes in sort of the history, you are angry, like even in the short-term history. And then the unconscious part of you that is referencing what decisions it should be making, how it should be acting, is now reading in the history books, oh, I am angry now, therefore I will start acting and thinking as if I am angry. So it can have a lot of impact, but it's impact through the, through the way it chooses to interpret reality. So remember I talked about how you can trick people into thinking they thought a woman was the most attractive or a, a political opinion was theirs even though it wasn't theirs, and they'll describe it in great detail. I would and, love for someone to try that on me. 
if, and, yeah. and see how it I doesn't work on to. everyone. Yeah. But if you then ask them again, they will often stick with this opinion that they encoded. Hmm. and not the original opinion they chose, because that's what's been encoded in their mental history as, as, as who they are. And, and this is a big problem with choosing to identify as something, right? And it's one of the big problems in our society where ideology has become a team sport, because you choose what you believe and how you emotionally react to the world based on whether or not you think it aligns with your team's objectives. If you like this clip, We've got more where that came from. Be sure to watch the full video and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss our new videos as they come out each week.